coming up next on KPBS Evening Edition. A major court victory for supporters of same-sex marriage today, but the celebration may be short-lived. And imagine an app that takes your blood pressure. A San Diego doctor says the digital age will revolutionize medicine. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Joanne Farian. And I'm Dwayne Brown. A federal appeals court says California's ban on same-sex marriage is unconstitutional. Today's ruling from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in San Francisco does not mean same-sex marriages will resume immediately. The court agreed to give Proposition 8 backers time to file an appeal. Today's ruling comes in a case filed by two same-sex couples. Because it affirms that equal rights and fundamental freedoms should never, ever be lobbied for. They should never be voted for, and they should never be subjected to the whim of a political campaign. Today's decision upholds a lower court ruling against Proposition 8. Proponents wanted the ruling set aside because the lower court judge was in a same-sex relationship, but the appeals court said it was unreasonable to presume the judge couldn't be impartial. Joanne has analysis of the case and what could happen next with her guests at the Evening Edition Roundtable. Joining me in studio are Matt Stevens, a civil trial lawyer who has more than a dozen years' experience in LGBT law, and Charles Lamandry, General Counsel for the National Organization for Marriage. Thank you both, gentlemen, for being here. Good to be with you, Joanne. Charles, I want to begin with you. Briefly tell us your involvement with Prop 8. Sure. As a General Counsel for California for the National Organization for Marriage, I help them with strategic planning and getting the vote out and answering various legal questions that came up during the course of the Proposition 8 campaign. The National Organization for Marriage is one of the leading proponents of Proposition 8. So were you surprised by the court's decision today? Not at all. We were anticipating that. You know, the Ninth Circuit is well known to be the most liberal and most reversed court in the history of the United States. So uh, given who was on the panel, we fully expected it would be at least a two-to-one decision against us, and that's exactly what we got. Now, Matt, Stevens, tell us specifically what the court said with regard to its ruling um, making Prop 8 unconstitutional. The, the court had to find whether there was a legitimate purpose for the law in order to be constitutional under the 14th Amendment. And what the court said is there is no legitimate purpose for this law. The only thing that it does is rob a specific group of people of their human dignity. The language of marriage must be equally applied to all Californians. Charles Lamandry, in terms of no purpose, in terms of this proposition, what do you say to that? I say that uh, the view of 63 million Americans from 31 states that have voted on this issue uh, would respectfully disagree. Obviously, there's a rational basis for marriage because it's intended to bring the two halves of humanity men and women together to produce the next generation. Heterosexual couples can do that, whereas our, our brothers and sisters in the gay community, although they're entitled to all the dignity and respect that we can give them, there are differences. Two people of the same sex cannot have a conjugal union that produces a human being. And there is a real purpose and a rational basis for having parents raise the children they produce and so that kids can have a mom and a dad. Then Matt Stevens, the court addressed this argument, didn't they? they? They did, and they said, as is true, that there's nothing about Proposition 8 that lends itself to achieving that objective. In other words, precluding a specific group of people from having the status of marriage, the word, does nothing to enhance procreation among anybody, in, including folks in the LGBT community. Uh, Charles, wouldn't you agree that this is basically a, a, a human rights or civil rights issue in terms of making sure all people have equal rights? Absolutely. And when you look at what's discriminatory or not, you look at whether or not people who are similarly situated are being treated differently. Uh, Same-sex couples are different from heterosexual couples, so they can be treated differently without violating the laws. I'm not sure. What do you mean are, are different? They're different only in the sense that they cannot have a conjugal union that produces a human being, which is the reason why government is in the marriage business to protect our most vulnerable citizens, which are the children, 
which are the product of that union Although between I a man and a woman. I think there would be a lot of people who might argue there are lots of men and women who can't produce biological children Absolutely. as well, and would that mean they can't be married? No, but there's always exceptions. But when we pass laws, we pass laws for the general rule, not for the exception. And the general rule now has been what it always has been throughout the entire course of history, including pagan societies like Greece and Rome, which did not discriminate against homosexuals, but realized that marriage had to be between a man and a woman just so you could know the product of that offspring is indeed the natural child of the parents, and that was for transmitting property, that was for transmitting the name of the father, uh, so that you can have a well-ordered society and you could have children uh, protected and raised by their own mom and dad. Matt? Yeah, and I, I think that the, you know, we, we have legislated history, and we have made people different separate from our laws. We've, we've done that. And so history isn't the high watermark for where we're going. And in this particular case, I think as the court correctly pointed out, there's no impingement of anybody else's rights by giving full equal status to gays and lesbians who want to marry. And it doesn't impair whatever religious feelings you might have about it or anything else. So there can't be, there is not a rational basis for excluding this particular group from a fundamental right. So what happens now in California? Can gays and lesbians get married tomorrow? They can't get married tomorrow because the mandate will not issue until after the appeal, essentially the appeal period expires. So there's a potential for notice of rehearing, there's a potential for appeal. So you're looking at a minimum of 21 days before anybody will be able to get married. Charles, do you think you have the people on your side? This Prop 8 passed narrowly, 52 percent, um, and there have been subsequent polls suggesting that it might not pass today. Do you yes. think people are still on your side? Absolutely. You know, the polls were predicting that we're going to lose Prop 8 when they voted on it the first time. Uh, our side always under polls. Quite frankly, people are a little intimidated when they're asked about this issue because a, a lot of people have been harassed. People who contributed to Prop 8, for example, people like me, and they're afraid to say how they really feel. But when they go to the polls, in every case, in 31 states, the people have voted in favor of traditional marriage, including so-called liberal blue states like California, Hawaii, Alaska, Wisconsin, Maine. We've never lost an election. So how the other side could say we don't have the people with us, 63 million people, the majority of the people by far, who, by, uh, by I think uh, uh, two out of every three people who have voted on it, have voted in favor of preserving traditional marriage. Do you think actually the people should be deciding this? I mean, the United States is a republic, and I think it's a republic for a reason. Um, do you think this is a decision that the majority should decide? Well, I think there's a couple of issues here, and, and one of them is I do think that this court hit where middle, middle America is on this issue. I think that the prior legislation that was passed is, is really old news. So that's kind of step one. Step two is, you know, do the people have a say? Obviously they do. But a lot of times we go to the polls and we are fear-based in what we're, we're legislating. And so civil rights, frankly, have never done well in the majority and that's expressly why our government is arranged the way it is there has to be checks and balances because the will of the majority can trample the rights of the minority finally what happens next i expect that there'll be a motion for a stay and that this same panel that issued this decision had previously granted a stay after the trial court decision striking down prop eight because it did not make sense to start issuing marriage licenses with the issue still before the courts. And that same logic applies now. Obviously, there's going to be appeal ultimately to the U.S. Supreme Court. It makes no sense to have marriage licenses being issued that are going to be somewhat in limbo until we have a final decision by the highest court. And I, I think there's a good chance that a stay won't be granted. There isn't a need for one. This court was really clear. And the, there are a significant number of Californians and, and folks in the Ninth Circuit running from Hawaii up to Alaska who have this legal right and should be able to exercise it. And that's the far more important. Matt Stevens, Charles Lamandry, thank you both for being here. My thank pleasure. you. Thank you. County Supervisor Diane Jacob is looking to regulators to explain how San Diego Gas and Electric violated no-fly zones for Golden Eagles despite using GPS tracking systems. KPBS investigative reporter Amitha Sharma joins us from the News Center. So, Amitha, what is Supervisor Jacob asking for specifically? 
Well, first, Wayne, the CPUC regulators in this case found that stg &E helicopters violated no-fly zones three times in January in these protected areas for the Golden Eagles. They're the nesting areas. Um, the company says, look, there were no injuries to birds, but this did happen last year. and. At the time, San Diego Gas and Electric came forward and said, listen, to prevent this from happening again, we're going to equip our helicopters with these GPS tracker devices. So what Supervisor Diane Jacob is asking for is she wants the PUC to explain to her and everyone else in this county as to what happened. Why did these GPS trackers fail? And what was the reaction, or is the reaction, from SDG&E about these nesting areas? Well, San Diego Gas and Electric says its preliminary findings show that this was due to pilot error, and so it has suspended the two pilots involved indefinitely. They also say, look, we've gone above and beyond any other company when building transmission projects to protect these natural habitats. And, and while these GPS, GPS trackers are effective, valuable, useful, they have their limitations. All right, we'll uh, stay on top of the story, I'm sure. KPBS investigative reporter Amitha Sharma. A diagnosis of breast cancer, something a young mother never expects to hear. Tonight from our Healthy San Diego desk, the story of a young woman who learned she had the disease when she was just 22. And we'll meet another young woman who's not only living with HIV, but also teaching others to live with it. This is KPBS Evening Edition. Tonight on KPBS at 8, the story of 400 courageous black and white civil rights activists as they face the brutality of the ugly South on Freedom Riders, an American experience. Then at 10, Frontline reveals the untold story of the incident in Haditha, Iraq, where 24 of the town's residents were killed by U.S. forces. And at 11, the campaign to free Nelson Mandela on independent lands. That's all tonight on KPBS. Hi, I'm Elsa Sevilla. If you find yourself hearing about a great program on KPBS after it's already aired, we have a solution. Get notified about your favorite TV programs on KPBS before they air by subscribing to the TV Highlights email alert. This daily email will feature the best programs coming up right here on KPBS TV so you can make a date to tune in or plan to record it. It's easy to register. Just go to kpbs.org slash alerts. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by The majority of women who are stricken with breast cancer are over 50. Nikita Garcia was diagnosed when she was 22 years old. KPBS health reporter Kenny Goldberg tells us the young woman is married and raising a daughter in Tierra Santa while fighting the disease. Five days a week at Moore's UC San Diego Cancer Center, dozens of patients come in for chemotherapy. If we're lucky, that's the last needle stick for the day. They sit for hours at a time to be poked and prodded and to get the potentially life-saving drugs into their bodies. Most of them are decades older than Nikita Garcia. Are you ready? <laughs> Garcia is 24 and is already in her third round of chemotherapy. She's also being treated with an experimental drug. Garcia's battle started in the fall of 2010. One day, she found a lump in her left breast. I knew it wasn't there before because I had been breastfeeding when my daughter was younger. And so I was always worried about clogged milk glands. So I was very vigilant. And so I knew nothing was there a couple months before. And all of a sudden, there was this, like, lump. Her doctor didn't think the lump was serious. But Garcia wanted to make sure. So she had it removed. Garcia remembers when the surgeon called to say it was a cancerous tumor. It'll be hot. I was at work and I just uh, made it to the restroom to go cry because it wasn't anything that I expected and um, just at my age you don't think about something like that and 
The only person I've ever known with cancer was an older cousin who passed away. So, of course, that's the first thing that popped into my mind was, like, how bad is this and how am I going to survive this? Garcia's husband is a sergeant in the Marine Corps and was stationed in Yuma, Arizona at the time. That's where Garcia had a second surgery to make sure the tumor was gone from her breast. That's how she spent her 23rd birthday. And so I started chemo right away without any time to look into it, any repercussions of what would come later, like infertility or obviously I thought I'd lose my hair and I did. So a year ago I was bald. After her first round of chemo, Garcia had an MRI to see if the cancer had spread. Garcia read the report before she saw her oncologist. So then when I went in and had my appointment with him, he said, oh, and now it's in the other breast. And I was like, no, it's not. It's in the same place as it was before. Didn't you read the report? And so then he flips through the page and he's like, oh, yeah, it is on the left side. So ever since then, I was like, I got to get away from this doctor. <laughs> Luckily, her husband got transferred to San Diego last fall. That's when Garcia started seeing doctors at Moore's Cancer Center. Her oncologist, Teresa Helston, says Garcia is the youngest woman she's ever treated with active breast cancer. Her cancer is responding very well to the treatment, and so that's always very encouraging. On top of that, besides seeing response of the cancer to treatment, we really like to see that the treatment is also not causing very many side effects, not too toxic, and she's sailing through with hardly any noticeable side effects. So that's like the best of both worlds. Still, Garcia had to have a double mastectomy. After that, cancer was found in her left lung. Nikita Garcia's breast cancer is classified as triple negative. That's the most aggressive type. Through all of her surgeries and many rounds of chemotherapy, Nikita has tried to maintain a normal family life. Is that how you go swimming? Yeah. Oh, okay. You're a good swimmer. Two-year-old Elena is Garcia's pride and joy. When Garcia's not in treatment, she spends time with her daughter and her husband, Anthony. We still, you know, go to movies, go on dates and stuff. Our parents come out and help out with our daughter. But as far as doing things that we should be doing, I don't, I don't really know what normal people do. Doctors say Garcia's cancer treatments will continue for some time. And she'll need to undergo reconstructive surgery in the near future. But for now, Garcia's not letting cancer ruin her life. She recently went skydiving for the first time. Even if you're uh, dealt a bad hand or something goes wrong in your life, you just have to kind of look past it and you just deal with it and then you keep going. That story by KPBS health reporter Kenny Goldberg. Doctors say breast cancer is almost unheard of in women under 25. A new book by a San Diego physician attempts to outline how technology is transforming medicine. Joanne is talking with the doctor at the Evening Edition Roundtable. Dr. Eric Topol is a cardiologist and professor of genomics at the Scripps Research Institute. His new book is called The Creative Destruction of Medicine, How the Digital Revolution Will Create Better Health Care. Dr. Topol, thank you for being here. Oh, it's great to join you. I want to talk about the title of your book, first yeah. of all, The Creative Destruction of Medicine. What does that mean? Well, it's a term actually from a, 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 an economist from the last century, Schumpeter, and how the world can be Schumpeter in medicine radical uh, innovation that really transforms the future of healthcare and medicine and basically it's because we have this digital infrastructure which is so incredibly developed uh, you know not only with smartphones and bandwidth and connectivity but also supercomputers and cloud computing social networks so if we just harness that that opportunity in the healthcare world which has kind of been in its own cocoon Finally, we can change the whole course of how medicine will be practiced in the years ahead. So give us some examples of how sort of the digital age can affect our health. Well, you know how uh, devices like smartphones and tablets change our daily lives uh, radically. Well, what about if that was healthcare? So, for example, you're checking your email and you're the, surfing the web on your phone or your tablet, and all of a sudden you can check your vital signs, your blood pressure, your glucose. Um, you can also look at your DNA and how it might react to a particular medicine that you could be prescribed or just was prescribed. So there's all this remarkable knowledge about 
each individual. There are new tools, new rules for how medicine will be practiced. So is this information, are these tools that you want the consumer of health to have access to or you want the physicians to have access to? Well, uh, the physicians can have actus, act, uh, access to, but it probably won't change their practice. So I think it has to be consumer driven for this to really uh, take off because it's one's own the ownership of the smartphone where all this data is going to be. Uh, DNA, it's, you know, it's your DNA. You, would, you have the right to have access to that. And so the medical community, for the most part, is very uh, resistant to change. Uh, in the book, I talk about it being sclerotic or even ossified, like bone, whereas the consumer is much more plastic and flexible and willing for, because they're so vested in their own health to take that, uh, that active role, that participatory role, and with their own uh, platform of a smartphone or their genome, they can actually make a big difference in how their health care uh, is, their health is preserved. Is it a little bit dangerous for us, the consumer, maybe the untrained consumer, to not really understand what all of these things mean, whether it be how our blood pressure might fluctuate throughout a day or a week, our glucose levels, that we might be armed with information we really don't understand. Right. Well, that was the argument with the Internet back in the 90s. Oh, they're going to... People get all this information and they're going to go, you know, really nutsy and become <laughs> cyber chondriacs. And, you know, we got through that. But this is very different. That information was about the whole population. Now we're talking about ind the individual's own information. They're, if they're high, high blood pressure, it's their blood pressure from beat to beat. If they have diabetes or pre-diabetes, they want to prevent that progression. It's their glucose every minute on their phone. So this is a whole different world now. It's not the Internet of the whole population. It's for each person. Uh, and I think this is going to make a big difference. Now, could it engender confusion? Sure. But that's why you still need the medical community to interact with, you know, to help gu get guidance. But to have access to information like we've never had before, it, these, these tools were not available. So why don't doctors want us to have all this great information? <laughs> well, it's kind of th threatening. But moreover, it's because the medical profession is, <laughs> is extremely conservative. And so, you know, it takes 17 years for an idea, uh, historically, to be actualized in day-to-day -day clinical practice. We can't wait 17 years. This is, this is something that could be so helpful, transformative, innovative today if we just allow it to happen. It won't happen via the medical profession, but they're critical to helping implement it properly. Dr. Eric Topol, thank you for being here. The title again of your book, The Creative Destruction of Medicine. And where can people find out more about your book or where can they get it? Well, they can get it on any of the uh, websites, Amazon, and iBooks, Barnes and & Noble. And, uh, and no, I think there's been fortunately a lot of great reviews and it's, it's off uh, to a really great start. Great. Dr. Topol, thank you. Thank you. African Americans in San Diego and across the country still have the highest infection rate among people with AIDS. Some say the prevention message seems to have gotten lost on young people between 18 and 24. Tonight, we meet a woman whose primary mission is to educate families on how to live with and avoid the virus. Asintia Wright has come a long way since she was diagnosed with HIV 16 years ago. As they say, took my lemons and made some wonderful lemonade. I don't even want to make lemonade like this anymore. Wright recalls how she was raped by three men after someone put the sleeping sedative Rohypnol in her drink. That one night turned her life upside down. This was new to me, and I knew that I lived in a neighborhood where I was very cautious of what would happen and what could happen to women, and uh, I just never expected that to happen to me. She now works as an HIV-AIDS counselor. We spoke at Christie's Place, a safe house for HIV patients since 1996 in San Diego. It provides services for women and their children to make it easier to get care and counseling. This is where Wright came for help when she was given only six years to live. That was 16 years ago. She now worries the prevention message isn't getting across to young adults. I tested a 18-year-old who's, and my thought to him was, where have you been when we were giving out all this knowledge? And that was his response. I never thought it would happen to me. So with a mindset like that, it's kind of telling me, do we have enough information out there? Do we have enough education out there? Are we really sending the right prevention messages to the youth? Because if they're still coming up positive, 
something's not being done right. There is some encouraging news. HIV infection rates among blacks in San Diego County have dropped significantly since the 1980s. This is KPBS Evening Edition. I'm Ray Suarez. On the next news hour, Margaret Warner interviews Italian Prime Minister Mario Monti about Italy and Europe's debt crisis. That's Tuesday on the PBS News Hour. In the last year, KPBS News has been honored with nearly three dozen awards. I'm extremely proud of these honors, and I thank you for your support as we continue to serve our local communities with award winning news coverage in the years to come. In his teen years, lots of people were saying they expected Bill Clinton to be president someday. They hated his guts and they would go to the end of the earth to destroy him. What a squandering of talent and possibility. Tonight has made Bill Clinton the comeback kid. A definitive look at the man and the president. Clinton, an American experience. Monday, February 20th at 9, only on PBS. Welcome back to the Public Square on KPBS Evening Edition. Tonight, your comments on the proposed hotel occupancy tax and yesterday's interview with San Diego City Attorney Jan Goldsmith. At issue is whether the entire city or just hotel owners should vote on the new tax. The city attorney says the law is not clear and a court must decide. Here's what some of you had to say. James Pressler writes... I agree 100% with the city attorney that this should not be a done deal, and it isn't. Proponents that often stand to reap the monetary benefits directly must stand accountable to the public. I have no problem with them voting among themselves to build their own coalitions, but the final say must go to the public. And Don Wood points out, Goldsmith made it very clear that this is a decision that the courts, not KPBS viewers, will be making. That said, I do believe that, that Goldsmith is right, and the state constitution requires that all city of San Diego voters should be the ones to vote on this tax, not just hotel owners. Well, if you have something to add, you can write to me, jferian at kpbs.org, or follow us on Twitter, or of course, you can always like us on Facebook. And now let's go back to the news desk where Dwayne has a recap of tonight's top stories. A federal appeals court has upheld a decision overturning California's ban on same-sex marriage. Supporters of Proposition 8 have promised to take the case all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And San Diego Gas and Electric suspended two helicopter pilots for flying into protected nesting areas of Golden Eagles while building a transmission line. The pilots intruded into no-fly zones three times last month, but no birds were injured. You can watch and comment on any of the stories you saw tonight on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks so much for joining us. You have a great night. We leave you with a look at the forecast.